Okay, so my name's Chris Follies. I'm from the University of the Arts London. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit, well, a lot about identity, basically, and it's all come out of uh, projects that we're running at the University of the Arts uh, around digital literacies. And it's part of the Digital Literacies Programme, the JISC-funded uh, programme, and we've been running this for nearly two years now, and, and I... Uh, the, the, the idea of identity is, has become very strong uh, part of the project. So uh, what Dial set out to do was to find these uh, individuals across the university that wanted to run projects on digital uh, problems. Um, we, we were looking at sort of cultural change and graduate employability as well, so that's why I've got an interest in that. And also, that I thought it was quite interesting from the last um, presentation about competence and, and the idea of competence and, that, and how that can be a, a deal breaker, especially with something like OER. And that's where I start stepping this territory of ego and things like that, which I'll talk about in a second. So, in terms of the communities, we, we've basically been forming these very sort of self, self driven, self identified communities by uh, staff and students within the university. And they've become communities of practice that we support as a project, basically. So here are some links here that where you can find uh, project resources uh, and the twi uh, twi uh, tweets, tags, Twitter tags that I use. Okay, so I've just come across uh, Eckhart Tule, I think his name is. I might pronounce that any better than me. Um, so has anyone, does anyone know this guy? I mean, I just did some YouTube searching, and, and I'm just fascinated with this, this guy. So I'm just going to play a little bit about, because obviously we all know what OER is, hopefully, by the end of this conference. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit about ego, because I'm no expert of ego. I'm just going on what this guy's saying. You recognize the ego, you're also free to choose something else, because you're not this. It's... Strictly speaking, it's not even the ego anymore. Strictly speaking, ego only exists when you don't know it exists. That's really the ego. When you know there is a certain behavior pattern happening in you which would, would, could be called the ego, it's not really the ego anymore because for the ego to operate in you needs your complete identification with it, your complete unconsciousness. <laughs> so you cannot... To take it a little bit further, even we could say then, uh, you can never see the ego in you because the moment you see it for what it is, it's not the ego anymore, it's only a behavior pattern. <laughs> uh, so people who are most trapped in ego, most strongly identified with ego, they have no idea about ego. They don't know it. They are it. Uh, the moment you see the ego, it's not the ego anymore, strictly speaking, and then you're free to choose something different. Okay. So, um, I've become a big fan, fan of his. I'm just watching all his videos on, on, on YouTube. Um, so, basically, in, in reflection of OER and actually uh, practicing OER, I, I see ego as a, as a, as a big problem. Um, the, the, the reason being that... Um, again, going back to the previous presentation, is that you're obviously putting yourself out into the world um, and, and you're also making judgments about how people are going to interpret uh, what you're putting out in the world. And in a way, your ego can be saying, don't do that. You know, don't, don't, just don't go there. And uh, to, to me, that's, that's potentially a, a deal breaker for, for open education. So... Uh, so we're basically looking at this awareness and, and, and what he talks about a lot is, is being aware of your ego. Um, and but once you're aware of it, like he said, you can move forward. So these are the kind of, the, 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 the kind of things that we're, we're coming up through Dial, through the project groups that have actually been identified through the evaluation as some of the obstacles for, for going into open education or, or practicing online. Um, and as you can see, confidence, self-image, uh, self-reflection, which is quite interesting as well. Uh, online reflection, we did quite a lot of work on that. Uh, criticism, being able to handle criticism, especially when you put stuff on YouTube and you 
where you get a troll or something like that. So uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, digital literacy is obviously your, your own uh, competences as well. And, and we did a lot of work at UAL in starting to in, into looking at definitions of competencies <clears throat> uh, and digital literacies and seeing whether they, they are separate. Um, so the blurring, yeah, that, that, that sort of personal, uh, professional blurring of boundaries and... Um, <clears throat> And basically, yeah, the, the, again, this, this sort of idea of, okay, I've put something out there, how's it being received? Because you don't really get that information back. Obviously, you get the odd comment uh, from someone, but you don't really know how this is being received. Am I doing the right thing here? Uh, shall I not do it, actually? Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I should go back to not doing it. So, basically, to get over those fear and uh, fears and, and anxieties, um, I, I think the only way is to go and try it. And I think that's the problem, and, and that's where the ego comes in, where it can it can basically stop you from doing that. And if you if you, I guess if you don't just go online and try it yourself, then you're never going to find out. So that's the that's the that's the big, the big, uh, step into it. The 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 other thing is obviously to have this this community of enthusiasts, which which are here, and, and this is the support network, the sort of where we are open support network, uh, to basically you know be there or, or, or be a, some sort of guidance for the, for the... This is a term that comes up quite a lot, digitally scared. It's quite an interesting term. And that's coming up in a lot of meetings, a lot of people using that. So basically what we need, if, if no one's starting to do this bit, then we're not going to get these, because you know, this is not going to grow, and we need it to grow. And that's basically what this is saying here. We, we need to basically encourage this, this growth of, this, of, of these... Uh, enthusiasts to support people. If you were to look at this statement, and I don't know, where, where would you put yourself uh, with, within this sort of group, uh, grouping here? Um, so, obviously, the unaware, I've come across this a lot, where I, I don't want to be anywhere online, you know, I don't want to engage with it at all. There's something I just don't want to don't go there. Uh, maybe they don't want to engage with their ego, I don't know. So, uh, I don't have skills to engage, so obviously the, the skill thing is, 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 a, is, a, is a barrier as well. Uh, and also I'm too busy, and this is, this is maybe where the ego lies as well. I'm, I'm too busy, someone else, someone else can, can be my, uh, my, you know, can put me online, you know. And, and, and actually, you think of all the celebrities, you know, some are using Twitter and things like that, but, you know, uh, there's a, especially a lot of artists, you know, that, that they're not online. They're basically being put online by their galleries, by their, their promotional people and stuff like that. And that's also happening in education with some of the sort of higher up uh, people that are maybe uh, trying to open education that they're actually doing it via someone else is doing it for them. Something. Is that a good thing? I don't know. They're not really there. So they're being put there by someone else. <clears throat> So the aware is this willingness. So again, this is kind of going into this awareness. So <clears throat> you're being more aware of, of being online. So, so you're willing to give it a go. But there's still this uh, anonymity. I still want to be anonymous. I'll pixelate my face. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try and hide my identity online, which is quite interesting. And then you've got the starter, which is the, the sort of willing, willingness just to, just to give it a go and want to learn more, really keen just to, just to get out there. And then you've got the person that's doing it every day. So we, we basically surveyed uh, a group of 50 students on one programme, so it's a mixture of first, second and third years, and um, we asked them to place themselves within these, these, these bits here, and this is, this is basically where this group of students uh, placed themselves, which was quite interesting. You know, there were really quite a lot in this sort of starter area. There was only one that put themselves as a confident, uh, in, in, the, in the confident, and Quite interesting sort of split there between the aware, uh, unaware and the aware, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, so we're now working with this group, which I'll talk about in a minute with some of the projects. Um, so, so this 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 group is is taking part in one of the, the projects. Um, and basically, at that presentation, we we're looking at obviously developing your online identities, and we started to look at this split between skills between these sort of relational being online and this sort of hard skills of actually doing the, doing the, the hard coding or uh, learning the software and things like that. So I think it's quite interesting to start to think of those 
as, especially as we're starting to define uh, digital literacies and competencies, is to actually maybe look at the, 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 the differences in skills. So this is the pro well, one of the projects of, uh, I think there's about 15 projects going on at the moment. Uh, so this is the online identities project, where we're basically uh, constructing a, but based on the, on the feedback from the staff and the students, um, the, from their needs, so they say, actually, you know, I need to know more about IPR, I need to know about building web spaces, I need, I need to uh, know about um, security and, and, you know, being online and, and um, all this sort of stuff. So, so what we're actually doing is building a programme around that, a sort of specially bespoke programme, uh, with collaboration with other departments of the university. Uh, and what we're also doing, which is quite unique, is uh, students and staff are learning together. And I think that's come through quite th a theme of this conference, is that, as that's come through quite strongly, and I'm, I'm really glad that we're hitting that mark. So, for instance, we're working with Learn IT, which is essentially a, a staff training. Um, but we're, th th they've opened that up to include students. But there's like a catch to that, that we've got to have 50% students, 50% staff for the course... To, for that course to run. But essentially, we've got free training, and that's what this is. It's been developed. You know, we've worked, worked with those and developed. We're also working with Lego. So we've got, we've got these, these sorts of courses that are uh, sort of UAL general, so across all six colleges. But we have these sort of specialist courses that are very much uh, run within the course, so targeted and organised by the individuals. So I'll just play you a little bit here because I am no professional of Lego Serious Play, but it's something that we're just about to do, uh, just about to experiment with. Has anyone used Lego Serious Play or heard of Lego Serious Play? Hello play. and welcome to the first of two videos about body, a more realistic kind of response. I collaborated with Lego, in particular Lego Serious Play, that's a division of Lego, and it's an existing consultancy process where people are asked to make things to explore issues in their organisations. I was using it for social research, however, in collaboration with them. You have to go through a process where people, first of all, get used to using Lego, maybe they haven't used it for a long time. Then we get them thinking and building in metaphors. Here, for example, I've said build a creature, and people have spent maybe five or ten minutes building a creature such as this walrus here. But then I say, in the next two minutes, turn it into how you feel on Monday morning or how you feel on Friday afternoon. This one here's a Friday afternoon feeling. We can see the wagging tail of a zingy haircut. He's on wheels, he's going forward, excited, looking forward to the weekend. So the participant there has moved from making something literal in Lego, a small animal, to making a representation of a feeling. Then, having gone through some more exercises, I would end up asking participants to build a metaphorical model of their identity in Lego. Here's one example. It's important to remember that this is just an example. A uh, Lego identity model can look pretty much like anything that's made of Lego. For instance, a very closed person might represent themselves as a very closed black box with very few features. This model is more colourful and open. Here are the different parts you can read for yourself. That bit represents love. That bit represents some sense of having some boundaries. This is about ideas and creativity. This part represents a kind of fear and anxiety. Over here we've got a love of nature. Here we've got being alert to the world and people's feelings. Up here, this is a windmill of communication. The window, because you can always see what they're feeling. I like an open book, doesn't it? Overall, we can see this is a moving, cheerful, optimistic kind of identity. But as I said, this is just one example. Importantly, the process gives people the opportunity to present their identities as a whole. If we were doing this study in language, people would have to present a list. First one thing, then another thing, then another thing. Building a metaphorical model in Lego means that participants can present it all in one go, and participants have a sense of balance. Okay, so has everyone got a Lego pack? Gosh, I brought the right amount. How did I know that? Um, so, like I say, I, I, it, this is new to me, Lego. Please feel free to, to build how you feel right now, or maybe at your identity, and maybe at the end we can have a little uh, 
a little crit on it, but I'll, I'll probably be told off for doing this because I haven't had the training to be a Lego, a Lego expert. Uh, where Fred has, who, who is basically the person that we're running this course with, uh, she's, she's a course leader and she's going to run it with her students uh, to basically nurture out that, that uh, information from the students about what, what their identities are and, and what, you know, what, how they perceive their sort of professional uh, online identities. Okay, so uh, defining digital literacies at UAL. Again, this ambiguity, which I thought was quite interesting from the keynote, this amb ambiguous this of uh, making a definition for something that's really almost impossible to define, digital literacy. Um, so basically, what we've done through a, a series of focus groups is started to break this up into, into these areas, really. And we, we've basically looked at this sort of stacking level, where actually what you're doing now individually is obviously you're reflecting on your own personal digital literacies or... or You've got a very good idea about what your digital literacies are, and that's where the individual uh, is very important. This is important because it's subjective, and every every person has something different going on. But we also have these sort of small groups. I don't know if you've ever done it, and you've gone to a, a sort of meeting somewhere, and then you sat next to someone that's got two iPads, and they're both talking to each other and showing each other how to do something. That's that. That's this organic, sort of natural uh, support system. Uh, it just happens. That's great. And then you've got the course project groups. This is starting to get a bit more formal, so maybe some more competencies for a certain course that you're going to need. Uh, the same for subject-specific. And as we go on, it becomes a little bit more general, right, right down to uh, disciplines, so the difference between an academic digital literacy and maybe a technical, a technician's digital literacy are going to be different. And then you've got the, the digital literacy of the college and institutional digital literacies, that maybe their perspectives, are they doing open education? And then we've got industry as well, which is quite interesting. So, and again, from the previous uh, speaker, about the digital literacies of, of an industry, you know, what are the requirements of that? Uh, and then we get this right down to a wiki definition. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about a, another project. Um, so basically this was uh, the teaching and development project which was run where PG Search students, um, over 100 staff from different art schools around, all, all over the place actually, were asked to put a two-minute uh, self-reflective video up, which was a real challenge. And a, a lot of the information that came back was one, it was a technical challenge, but uh, the other bit was the identity. A lot of them didn't want to do it. They didn't want to put themselves on it. They didn't want to, their students to see them as, as learners as well, which was quite interesting. Uh, but they did in the end, and the 120 videos went up. I'm just going to play this one. I'm an associate lecturer on the BA Fine Art degree for a personal tutor to six to eight students in each year. The problem I identified within my practice was insufficient contact hours with my personal tutees. Because these contact hours are conventionally scheduled as individual tutorials, time with each student. I won't play it all, but you, but you get the idea. So basically, this the students. Uh, almost totally hidden their identity uh, by doing a, quite an amazing animation um, using a digital voice um, and I thought and it was put up by, the, uh, by Lindsay who was running the course and actually running this project and I, I, you know, I, I saw this and I thought that's amazing and there was quite a lot like this where they've been really creative in the way that they've, they've put their put the, put content out um, and I was like you know who is she? I was like, no, it's not she, it's a he. <laughs> so I thought it was quite funny as well. So um, let's just get back on. So in a way, this was compulsory, and I think this is quite interesting. So this is like a compulsory, that they were made to be open, and they, uh, they changed slightly the, the way they did that they, they, they come up with very creative ways some people just went for it and just went and recorded themselves online there was also quite an interesting video where someone was talking and almost towards the end she just went into hysterics because she's talking to herself in the camera probably for the first time she's ever done it and um, and she left it in and I thought that was quite nice you know it was like oh, hysterics and then oh god and then carried on it was quite <laughs> 
So, uh, okay, so we recently took on two dial coordinators as part of the project, um, the dial project, and um, this was quite interesting because, again, the, 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 the two coordinators were not necessarily, um, uh, you know, they weren't online. So it was a challenge for them as well. So in a way, this was kind of compulsory because we were saying, you know, as part of this job, you're going to have to do more online, more blogging. Um, and the feedback from them has been fantastic. You know, they've been talking about this being an amazing experience for them. And basically, they wouldn't have done it unless they'd done this job. So I think that's quite an interesting way of, of, of this sort of compulsory idea. And then we've got the voluntary. And uh, so processarts.ac.uk is, is a project that's been going on for quite a few years now. I first presented this in 2010, OER 2010, actually. which is quite interesting, when it was in its early days. Uh, it's still going on now. It's now uh, just been taken on as a, a university um, service, which is fantastic. And this encourages this maybe more voluntary, natural uh, uh, community building, uh, a place for us to all come together and develop a, a project, uh, resources, and talk about them. Uh, another thing we're doing at UAL, which is again uh, open practice embedded in, within the PG CERT, which is again really interesting because there's a, a forum going on here now. This is a brand new course that's just started and the forum is fascinating uh, because the, the, the tutors that have, and technicians that have uh, decided to do this course are, are really wanting to... This is a support system and it's fantastic and you can see that they're really enjoying this uh, and they really want to do it. So in a way, it is, it's not really compulsory as such, it's, it is in that voluntary because they've, they've chosen to do this and uh, they really want to do it. And I think that's kind of what it's all about. And I think if, if to make the step into open, you've really got to want to do it and enjoy it. And, and, uh, and I think that's the vibe of this conference, which I, I, I like I said, I was, the first conference I went to was 2010. And the vibe at this conference has uh, been really different. It's been really you know, passionate and, and natural, and, and uh, it just, just feels, feels really different this year. Okay, so uh, let, let's see. Anyone read this? Okay, if you get a chance, please read this book. <laughs> it's free. You can download it for free. Uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing book. I, I, I love it. And... Um, the, well, one of the things he talks about here is this me and the motivations, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, about you know why are you doing this? Why are you why why are you being why are you sharing stuff online and things like that? Um, so me regarding because I enjoy doing it, I do it for fun. I like to do it. I want to do it, and that's that sort of really maybe where we are within the open education within uh, open educational practice and then you've got the the regarding which is uh, again to uh, help a project course uh, helping others uh, want it to be part of a mission e.g. support sharing resources and ideas so but he also explains that they're, they're not the same as well uh, and you, you kind of put yourself in two camps and he gives uh, two good examples here of these thin shifts because he talks about uh, the sort of sharing economies, which is quite interesting. Um, so, and the whole commercial and sharing economies, and I think that's really important at the moment with what's going on with MOOCs, for instance. So, he talks about thin sharing economies, so Skype, you know, you get something out of it. Um, or, uh, and then Wikipedia is again, is this, is this sharing economy where um, it's, it's not, uh, motivated not by money, but by the fun and joy of what we do, and, and really that's what, to me, what open education is. So, at that point, I'll stop talking because I want to hear about your fantastic Lego models. Um, but I've just put up this just in case uh, there was silence and my ego kicked in and thought, oh God, that was bad. So, um, I've just got some questions here that are, are the things bubbling away about ownership. You know, do we have to attribute all the time? Can we just give stuff away? You know, do we really? Does it make us feel a lot better that some, something's been attributed? It's actually a pain, a real pain to attribute. Um, digital citizenship, uh, the, the sort of whole maintaining an open uh, online practice is, is, is hard work, and it's, a, it's daily work. Presenting and communicating practice what you do, a really important part of uh, working with staff at the UAL, but, it, you know, it's, you know, if the information's there and easily accessible, um, we, we kind of know what you do. And you're easier to find, and uh, 
It just makes life a lot easier. Um, managing capacity, so basically how do you fit that into your, again, that's another big job, you know, how do you fit all this into your, into your, into your day job? Uh, the school of open practice. Uh, so yeah, a few, like I say, there's few courses, there's, there's not much here that can ha help you into open practice, we need more of that. Uh, I think the communities of interest are really interesting, and the addiction. Anyone ever talk about the addiction of OER? Because it is addictive. You know, I'm, addi I'm an addict. Uh, you know, <laughs> it is. And I think, uh, you know, we need to sort of maybe look a bit more into that, into this, this idea of uh, uh, addiction. So, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to talk about their... <laughs> Maybe that's the difference between engineers and art, because engineers don't need to be taught how to play Lego. Like no. <laughs> yeah, well, well, this is it, because there's, there's, there's actually no teaching it, and like I say, it's, it's, it's really... It's, it's natural instinct and, and that physical element of just building something. Um, but I think, that, I think that the whole idea of metaphors, and again, that was talked about in the earlier keynote, uh, about being able to build something... In, uh, uh, and, and provide some metaphors for that. So, mm -hmm. is there anyone willing to give a? <laughs> oh, we need a, we need a little a camera. There you go. I had to make a video. Yeah. I must be going <laughs> so, I was so wondering how much symmetry was the factor in everybody's uh, modelling, by the way. <laughs> it looks, you know. But then it's, it's, it's slightly prejudiced because most of the breaks seem to come as pairs. Right. Okay. So, so, we, so it, 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 it allows you to do symmetrical things. Yeah. Yes. So just to explain the, 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 uh, the, these kits that I've given out here. We've basically got a hundred of them, and, and we're going to uh, basically we, th these are used if I if I've got this right. These are used to just to get people warmed up, and then we've got identity kits, which are the beef kits, and they're, they're like the ones with animals in and and uh, m m more stuff, so you can you know come up with more metaphors for things. Uh, there's also connectors, because the idea is that if we have time now, we'd all get together on a table and we'd use connectors about how, how so, so how about moving, I need to move now, I need to leave the room, I can't take any more, and that connects with this person over here because they're looking at me or something, I don't know. But it, it's, it's, you know, it's about them making connections as a, as a, as a group, which is quite interesting. So these sessions will be like sort of two hours long. Okay. What is wind as a weapon? A weapon? No. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. That is waving the flag for teaching and learning. Which <laughs> is what I have to try and do. It's also the only time in my life when I get to have hair. <laughs> or be it pink. <laughs> Fantastic. Sorry, did you have a question? No, I was just going to share my oh, great. It's the closest I could get to a horse. The horses. Yeah. She doesn't mind me. <laughs> 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 yeah. you, you, you talked about digital literacies being subjective. Mm. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, if you're developing digital literacies in your students, do you, do you take, there's a core set of literacies that you feel that these students need to possess, and then we allow them to develop in their own directions. Are there two parts to it, or do you just say, let's see what happens given the free space? I, 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 th I think there are two parts, because, um, so, so one of the projects we're doing with one course, separate course actually, is to do a very formal competencies for that course. So, mm. so they, they want to just have a, a, a defined list of the core competencies for that course. Um, and I think this is where the separation is. And I think, and, and from these, it's an ongoing dialogue actually, because we're running focus groups. We're going to carry on running focus groups at the end of the year. And what, what's starting to happen is that there is a separation between competences and digital literacies, where digital literacies are seen a little bit more harder to pinpoint, to, to, to pin down, basically. Where competences, you can say, all my students are going to have to do Photoshop, they're going to have to do Final Cut Pro. Uh, because it's a, it's a media course or whatever, and those are competences. But as we're finding in, in the projects, uh, a lot of the projects, is a, lot of the, a lot of the training is, doesn't exist, and this is what we're doing. We're inventing, we're doing some bespoke training, you know, and, and, uh, and I think that's really interesting. That's really where these digital literacies, 
this, this idea that it's agile, you know, it's, it's, it changes constantly. So we might do a session and we find out there's actually another digital literacy that we need to address, you know, that doesn't exist. There's no training for that. We're going to have to make the training. And, and are they, how, how are they informed from the wider world? You know, how do you bring that? What industry demands are, you know, there's, the, there's an employability aspect of digital yeah. literacy. How do you gather that information to highlight it the students to get them to think about? Yeah, that's the thing. So, so we've been working with the Creative and Cultural Skills uh, <coughs> Council, which are uh, fast. It's it, again, it's it's, um, and we want to do more work. So, so for instance, we've had uh, people coming in to do uh, we have a social media event, and we had someone come in from a business that basically talked about how they use social media. Mm. And it was like, oh, and the students were like, we want more of this. You know, this is like the information we need to know. This is now. Um, so the creative and cultural skills, for instance, what we'd like to do with them is to do uh, a collaborative, uh, some sort of research, and maybe commission some sort of research where they go off and find out what employers want. You know, what, what are the skills, the skill sets that are important. And also, you know, to find, especially in terms of online identities, you know, do do businesses Google you? I, I Google people when you want to find out something. You Google, that's what you do, isn't it? So what do you, what, what comes up when you Google people? You know, is that important? You know, or is it, you know, if you are, because um, we're working with students as well, so I've got some students that are actually really into open education, and they're, they're becoming really good practitioners. And, you know, so if you, you Google that student, you've got a great idea already. You can say, wow, this is an amazingly competent student. You know, I've just seen them present, or I can see their work here. You know, does that help? Does that, does that, is that a, a benefit, you know? Do employers take that into account? I don't know. That's part of that research. I guess. Just I was interested actually following up on that. The, uh, that self-declaration of students early on about the aware and aware and, and so on was really quite surprising you know, mm. because we make this implicit blanket assumption that everybody yeah. comes in and they're perfectly happy doing all sorts of things in yeah. a digital environment, and that yeah. isn't yeah. necessarily the case. We always tend to focus on the staff side of things. Yeah, yeah. we are not. Exactly. Yeah. Especially within the professional side, because you know it's, the, it's their practice, and it's actually they start to think about their careers, sure. and um, you know, where, where they might be super confident in their sort of personal online identities, mm. you know, in, in managing the photos of themselves yeah. out on a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, managing photos of them, their practice is, is something that's not on the radar, but it's also something that's not taught in the, in the, in the you know in the curriculum. So I guess that's what we're doing is looking at how that embeds within the curriculum, yeah. you know, that course, that sort of thing. Um, can I just say I'd, lo I'd love photos of this, so either uh, of your models. So unless, it, so please leave your models so I can photograph them. If you would like to be photographed with your model, I'd love that as well. I'll make that make a fantastic set. Of them. Um, or if you want to photograph it yourself and tweet it, that'd be um, that'd be pretty good. I, I think we could seriously have some uh, serious Lego tweets going on. And remember, the hashtag is uh, MER. Th 13, 13 D1 D2 D2, D2. D2. <laughs> Any tweets gone through yet, or no? I can't see any. Some gone through. Is, is, is the first tweet to come? 
Mine's on there. Two, uh, about five down. Four. Oh, is it? There you go. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Nice. <laughs> I look forward to looking through those. Okay, thank you. Okay, we move to the next session. Now we've had the facilitated discussions which happened here.